Welcome, everybody. My name is Matt Reiners. I'm the co-founder of Eversound. And with me today is Anthony Ormsby Hale, Vice President of People Operations for Civitas Senior Living. Anthony started in senior living as a director of sales and marketing and has worked his way up to an executive director, a regional director of sales and marketing, and now vice president of people operations. In addition to the amazing work he's doing at Civitas, Anthony has started his own podcast, Humankind Podcast for Leaders, while also being a co-founder of the Young Professionals Network, a part of the Texas Assisted Living Association, as well as being a workforce development committee member. Today, we're going to be discussing staffing, workforce development, and human resources. Thanks for joining us today, Anthony. Matt, it's my pleasure. Great to see you again. You as well. So let's uh, jump right into it. Recruitment and retention has always been top of mind in the senior living world. How have you seen recruitment change since COVID-19? Well, it certainly got a lot more challenging, not that it was necessarily easier prior to that. I think, you know, regardless of the industry that you're a part of and the type of employee that you're trying to recruit, um, we've seen companies have to become more creative in the way that they attract candidates and manage them through the process. I think we also have seen the rise of, I, I call it a concierge style recruiting service. We certainly get a lot more questions from candidates. They want to know, you know, transparency into the process. They want, you know, that process to be fairly simple. Um, gone are the days where, you know, we would do three or four level interviews. Now it's let's try to get this as quick as possible, as efficiently as possible, making sure that we are being collaborative and uh, including everyone that needs to be part of that process, but definitely trying to get people in the door and screen them and interview them, make sure it's a good fit and um, get them hired as soon as possible. Makes sense. Yeah. I mean, hey, we got to get people into the into the community to be able to help and improve that quality of life. And I'm curious, um, you know, across the board, have you seen anything work well or anything that hasn't worked as well? Well, uh, just in the past year, we've had an opportunity to really experiment in quite a few different areas. I would say areas that work well, and I've talked about this with colleagues in and out of senior living, any way that you can automate the recruiting process to you know, keep candidates engaged. And I think about it fairly similar to the way that we manage the sales and marketing process, whether you're in senior living sales or just sales in general, um, how are you introducing yourself to the consumer or in this case, the applicant? How are you engaging them in the story? And essentially, how are you setting yourself apart from every other uh, community or company that they've applied to? I think on average, the last Indeed study I read showed that candidates apply to on average nine jobs and they're, you know, in an immediate period that they're hunting for. So when you think about that, you think about the, let's just say every company does the thank you for applying email. Um, most of us are using a pre-screening tool, whether that's predictive index or disk or something like that. So they're getting that email. Um, they're likely getting an email to schedule their application. How are we fitting all of that in? In addition to, you know, we just came out of an election, all of the fundraising emails that you get and the discount emails. And I don't know about you, but during COVID, I signed up for about 20 million shopping lists and, you know, Amazon and all that. So it's very easy for candidates to lose you in their inbox. And so if you're relying just on the email piece to, to get candidates in the door, that's not very effective. And so uh, we really look at it as, um, you know, from a sales perspective of how are we having those multiple touch points, different mediums to connect with different folks, um, and also casting a wider net and not focusing on, you know, one particular profile of candidate. Um, are we able to look at non-traditional candidates in a sense of maybe uh, recently retired individuals that could apply for certain roles? Um, it's a really great tie into diversity and inclusion initiatives, but also it keeps you from, um, you know, narrowing your candidate pool as much as possible. Yeah, no, and it makes sense. And, you know, it makes sense getting people through the door, right? And then we kind of hear this age old topic of healthcare worker burnout, um, especially, you know, during the pandemic and, you know, how it is a real concern for senior living right now. And, you know, I'm curious how you've seen people manage this successfully and, and like to keep staff motivated during such a challenging time. Yeah, um, I mean, it's been a tough year for all of us in and out of healthcare. And I think, the first thing that I've seen successful managers, successful companies do is to acknowledge that, um, you know, coming into a meeting where you're sitting around and everyone is whether they've been up all night with a new baby or maybe 
um, you're dealing with, um, you know, personal issues in your life, it's, you know, just acknowledging that we're all coming from a place that many of us are anxious, many of us are frustrated, some of us are angry at the way that things are going in the world, um, and how do we process that in a healthy way, knowing that it's pretty impossible for people to kind of check that at the door. And that used to be the mentality, right, of, hey, don't bring your personal problems to work because here we need to focus on the customer. But it's really hard to do that. And I think when we acknowledge, whether that's as a manager, as a supervisor, or even just as a peer, uh, saying, you know, how is this individual bringing their full self to the, to the workplace today? Um, how can I support them in that? And how do we do that in a way that that's a productive and healthy conversation? Because there are ways that you do that and it becomes a distraction to the business, right? Where, you know, your entire organization loses focus of the reason that we're here, whether that's to serve the customer, to serve the client, however you do that. But um, when we think about burnout, it typically, I think that you can boil burnout down to one singular moment of, I have lost hope or I've lost faith that things will get better. Um, and so, and I talk to people all the time about this where, you know, they will say, oh, well, I know we're going to be short staff tomorrow, um, or I know that I'm not going to get the supplies that I need, or I've gone to my manager three times about this problem and nothing has been done about it. And so they decide to quit. They no call, no show. They don't return to, um, to the workforce. They move companies. And that doesn't necessarily fix their problem because they're likely to experience the same issues at the next workplace. But what we have lost is that relationship where I can go to them and I can say, I hear you. I hear your concerns. Um, it's not going to get fixed overnight, but we are working on it. And here's what that process looks like. And there's transparency in that. So um, pizza parties are great. You know, I love a slice of pizza just like everybody else, but that's not going to fix employee retention issues. And I know that's a hard lesson for many of us to learn because it feels really good to to walk in with the cookie cake and the ice cream and to say, hey, we really appreciate all of you, when really what our employees want, um, regardless of whether or not you're in healthcare or not, is they want to be able to do really meaningful work. They want to know that the work that they do matters. Um, they want to know that when they show up, that it makes a difference. If I feel like if I don't show up to work, is anybody actually going to miss me? Is anybody going to notice that I'm not here? That's horrible. That's a horrible feeling to have. And there's really no motivation for me to, you know, um, find somebody to watch my kids or, you know, if my tire goes flat on the way to work, do I have the, the incentive or the motivation to call an Uber or to change that tire um, and do that? So all of the little things that keep people coming back to the door. Um, I remember walking into a community a couple of weeks ago and having a chance to talk with team members and just starting off by saying, you know, I know that you and I don't know each other personally, but I just want to say thank you because I know that the work that you do is really important and I know that it's really appreciated. And whether or not you care that I appreciate you, just know that the people you're taking care of on a daily basis appreciate you and doing that. Because sometimes we forget to say that, we become so engulfed in our own lives. And, and for me, I could see kind of heads start nodding around the room and I think people appreciate that. Now that's not a license for me to not work on all of the other issues that we need to focus on, but it's a good way to start and build that relationship because you can offer, you know, top tier salaries, you can offer fantastic benefits, you can do the Google catered lunches all day long. But if I'm working for a boss that I don't like, it's very easy for me to leave that person. And, and I think that that's what contributes to burnout is when there's no healthy way for people to process ways that we're operating inefficiently. Um, we look at you know, when I see people kind of spinning their wheels or I see them doing things in a way that's not efficient and I know that they're getting frustrated with it, they're getting really tired of, of going through that. And when they don't have hope that they can go through a process to get that fixed. And so, you know, what are ways that we inspire employees to come forth with ideas and do that? And I remember working as an executive director in Houston and just going through and working with every single department and saying, you know, what's your biggest challenge today? What frustrates you the most? And, you know, that was different for all of the different employees. For my chef manager, it was he didn't have enough storage. So he had stored. We were a six-story building in Houston. So the kitchen was on the third floor. And so he had a small storage. And then he had a larger storage period, um, storage area on the first floor. So he would say, I'd have to run down every single time to the third floor, come up and do that. And it was just exhausting for him to do that or just send a staff member. So you're looking at how do we how do we solve that problem? How do we fix that? Because it's those little kind of micro frustrations that I think build up to where people say, okay, I'm just not going to deal with this anymore. And I'm going to go find a place where it's going to be better.
So yeah. I think that's how we deal with burnout. Yeah, and it makes perfect sense, right? Like those little micro frustrations, you know, continue to build up and one could be the straw that breaks the camel's back. So being proactive, and I think you kind of hit it on the head in terms of like that being empathetic, being a listener and really and really listening and, and taking action on the suggestions that are coming out from your team and, and being proactive and finding those solutions just to help people. And um, it seems like yeah. you guys are doing some really awesome stuff when it comes to that. And, you know, one thing we've I've experienced or I've seen, you know, from what I've heard in working with communities is sometimes this, you know, during this time and the burnout, when staff has had to wear multiple hats and, and help each other out um, or be asked to do things that might not have been on the original job description, you know, because I think everyone's world changed right over the last year. But have you guys have you have any learnings on how less rigid areas of responsibility can help benefit communities from resident and staff satisfaction? Yeah, you know, this is a uh, probably one of my favorite areas of learning and development because this is where I think you see people grow. And, you know, just in my own personal example, um, you know, if you were to look at my resume, you would say, oh, my God, this guy doesn't know what he wants to do for a career. Um, but it's the part that you look at and you learn, okay, what I learned in sales really helped me run a building efficiently. I really understood the impact of finances on a um, community. If we offered this incentive, how would that affect my NOI? And that made me a more effective executive director. And then moving into human resources, understanding how the business operates really helps me understand how do I safely help this individual get the operational you know, end result that they want in a way that protects the company from risk. And when you approach it in that way, and the reason that I'm able to do that is because I've been fortunate enough to have those experiences. So we really focus on um, making sure that every employee understands how other job functions operate uh, for a couple of reasons. One, I think it creates transparency into what are my coworkers doing? And, and I always pick on sales when I give this example because when you go to team meetings, back when we could go to networking events, sometimes you'd hear the marketer say, okay, I'm going to three networking events. I've got a lunch, I've got a happy hour, and then I've got a breakfast that I'm going to go to. And so other people on the team may say, oh my God, all this person does is they go out and eat, they get a drink, and they don't realize the business connections that are taking place there. You know, I'm, I'm sure you remember back when we could go to like our Jensen conferences, you probably made really valuable business connections at the happy hour or at a networking event that you could go to and do that. So those are really important. And so what we started doing was, was encouraging, you know, the salesperson to take someone along with them. And I absolutely, one of my favorite um, things to do when I was an executive director was to have my activity directors go out with the sales team because we could talk about clinical outcomes all day long and we had really great data to support that and the salesperson could go to a doctor's office. One, it was really hard to get the nurse out of the building that long to do that. So typically that wasn't possible, but going back and talking about the life of the community and this is a program that we're doing, this is a way that we keep residents engaged, um, maybe a special program that we're doing in memory care. I know um, at my last community to be an executive director for I had two certified rec therapists on staff who were phenomenal and our, we were able to reduce behavioral outcomes and memory care through the rec therapy approach instead of using um, different types of medicine to control those behaviors. And that helped us increase referrals to our community. And so, but it also helps my activities people understand what the salesperson does. It's tough when you have to do 10 sales calls a day and I don't know about you, but I'm drained at the end of the day. If I talk to, you know, 15 different people, I just want to go home and kind of, you know, slink down in my chair and do that. But it helps people understand the different jobs, what their goals are. But then you create this team cohesion and this team camaraderie, because now that I understand what you're working towards, Matt, now that I understand what's important to you, I know how I influence that. And I know that when I throw a really great resident event, that you can market that to your, to your prospect list. Um, and it helps, it works with sales and it works with marketing and maintenance and all of those pieces really come together. And because sometimes we tend to get into these silos, right? Where we, we all know what we're supposed to be doing, but we don't really know how that, that impacts the other folks. And, and when you start talking about, um, you know, caregivers and housekeepers and servers and doing that, the same concept really applies. And I think that this is where it's even more important because one, you have a more agile workforce, right? If somebody calls in as a server and you're short one server that day, everyone else who's working maybe as a caregiver or a housekeeper should know how to work the point of sale system. They should know how 
to get something out of the bistro if a resident asks for it. They should know what the menu for the day is. One, because there's nothing more frustrating to an employee than having to say, I don't know. I don't know what that answer is. Um, and I don't know how to get that information for you because nobody's ever trusted me to train me to do that. And it's pretty simple, right? We, we know where the activity calendar is, we know where the menu is, we know where all of that. So there's no reason why an employee should ever have to tell a customer or a family member, I don't know, because it's frustrating for everyone that's involved with that. So I think that that's a one area where, one, you just create this workforce that's able to adapt and respond to the customer's needs, but then you start looking at people outside of their role. Instead of saying, you know, oh, we need somebody really energetic and outgoing, let's get the marketer. Maybe my maintenance director is really great at building quick relationships with folks. And, and we use a system at Civitas called the Predictive Index that helps understand behaviors and needs to, to see, you know, here's the goal that this team has, who's the best person for it, regardless of job role. If I need somebody who's gonna help me with process and precision, don't ask Anthony to do it because Anthony hates details and, and really can't, you know, manage long term having to do with detail incremental work. But maybe we want somebody who really likes that type. So it's been really great to understand how people bring their talents and their abilities to help support an entire workforce in doing that. And I think when businesses do that, you get more innovation, you get better team cohesion, which always I think produces better outcomes. Yeah, and I couldn't agree more. And I think you really hit it on the the head talking about like people working in silos. And if we're able to kind of get a glimpse of what other people do, and you know, we work with a lot of activity directors, and sometimes from what I've heard is that they others look at them as just having fun all day, but when really they're doing all these different things. And if we can kind of get a glimpse and into each other's worlds, it really helps with that cohesion, like you said, and, and all mo moving towards like a common goal. Um, and even getting those glimpses, I think of my personal life where I've had to be, you know, working from home now and my wife listens in on every call that I have, whether she likes it or not. And she said to me, no wonder when you come home, you don't want to talk as much because you're talking all day. So it's kind of giving yeah. those glimpses and building that empathy and really just aligning on, you know, what makes sense and moving together uh, in a cohesive unit. So, no, it makes total sense. And you guys, it sounds like you guys are doing some awesome things. Um, now, final question here for you, Anthony, if you could provide three takeaways from your experience that other operators can take away from staffing, retention, recruitment um, with that landscape now and in the future, what would you suggest? Yeah, that's a great question. I want to go back really quick to your wife having to hear you um, in the workplace because there was nothing worse than when my husband found out that he was married to a let's circle back guy. <laughs> um, and I never heard the end of it. Um, he goes, you know, he's like, I'm really glad that you don't use your HR voice at home because I think that that would be the end of our marriage. Uh, so lots of great discovery happening for couples working together this year. Yeah. But to answer your question about three, you know, three things, I think there's so much that we can learn. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure you've seen on LinkedIn, I've seen the post where, you know, people talk about, you know, going back to the, you know, the way that things were. And I really hope that we really don't, because I think we've learned so much in this past year. Um, I'm definitely looking forward to getting back to going to lunch with friends and going to conferences and doing that. But, um, you know, first, I think going back to how do we build and sustain relationships, um, whether that's with individuals in our company or outside of our company, Nothing that nothing else that I say here really matters if you don't have a good, healthy relationship with either the people that are on your team, the people that you report to, um, and of course with your customer. Um, if you're if that relationship is not founded on trust and transparency, um, then you really can't be effective, no matter how hard you try or how great your idea really is. Um, and then I think looking at how do we focus on, um, you know, giving people hope. Um, I love the Silverado motto or mission, love is greater than fear. And I think that this past year has been a huge, um, a, a big year of fear for all of us, whether it's fear of the unknown, um, things that happen in and out of healthcare that people are, are really concerned about. And so if you can give people that insight into what love and hope looks like, and I know that that, sound may, that may sound really cheesy, but there are ways that businesses can do that just by letting them know like, hey, I hear you. Um, here are ways that we're working on that. And I think about uh, V Senior Living. Judy Whitcomb is their, their senior VP of HR and Learning and Development. And uh, they just started a diversity and inclusion series where they hired a consultant to go in and do that. And I think when we can have those conversations, they may be uncomfortable, 
but it helps me understand the people that I work with on a day to day basis. It helps me um, understand how to connect with them. And I think that that's really valuable. And then the third thing I think is, you know, we really are looking at, again, in healthcare and in not looking at our workforce. And um, I had an opportunity to talk with somebody who was working um, in a warehouse job, and they talked about the feeling of wanting to leave that because they really just felt like a machine. They were constantly timed for how to do things. They were having to meet quotas. And so how do we reframe the conversation of business metrics and accountability and KPIs in the sense of not, I want you to do all of these things because it's going to produce more revenue because let's face it, not a lot of employees really care about the net, the amount of revenue that we face, that we generate. Most employees don't even know how much money we actually generate because we don't talk about the business with them. But when I can talk to them and say, hey, when you respond to a resident pendant under three minutes, that means that we're able to quickly meet their needs. And when we maintain that average, when we're, and we're able to provide better, better care, I care about that as a caregiver because that's why I'm here. I want Mrs. Smith to have the best day possible. And so, you know, when we talk about it in terms of your action produces this result for this person, I think that that's the winning way to go about it. Um, I could be totally wrong. You know, there could be people out there who have a much better way of doing it than that, but that's what I've seen to be effective. I know that's what motivates me. When I do my job really well, that means that our managers and our leaders can can lead their teams effectively. And that, that I think, at the end of the day, helps residents live the best quality of life possible. Yeah, no, and awesome, awesome stuff, Anthony. And, you know, I couldn't agree more with you. And, you know, to hear that you're a let's circle back, you know, I'll let that one slide for now. But uh, I just thank want you. to thank you so much for uh, spending some time with us here today. Anthony, it's been a pleasure. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, one of the up and comers in the senior living space and uh, no pressure or anything, but we are expecting amazing, continued amazing things that you're able to provide uh, the residents at Civitas and uh, continuing to improve their quality of life. So thank you. Thank you, Matt. I appreciate it.